Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, welcome back to this 10th lecture for the course on psychology of uh, language. Last lecture we were focusing on words and as I described in the last lecture, uh, we made a shift in, in learning in the last lecture from the last lecture itself. So, coming lectures are more into the, uh, the, the complex dynamics of uh, uh, psychology of language. Up till the ninth lecture, we are looking at the primary um, factors or primary dynamics of psych uh, psychology of language. Uh, so, we in detail dealt about uh, some aspects of words in the last lecture and what we will do today is we will continue uh, those facts. Now, words are important, why? Because uh, uh, words are the subway station or the mid station between uh, written and, uh, and, and uh, uh, I mean the subway station for uh, rather the spoken and written language and below it uh, you have uh, those constraint parts which make up word and above it you have uh, things like sentences and discourse. So, this is kind of a midway station uh, where, where uh, which can be exactly uh, uh, said to be uh, a, a stop or a, 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 a more, uh, an important aspect of language because word symbolizes something called concepts. Now, it is at the level of the word itself where the language takes its true form. Before that, it, it, it has, uh, it, there are constant parts which uh, make the language, but word, word is the most important uh, part of it. Now, before we <coughs> go into today's lec uh, lecture, let us take a little trip to the first nine lectures of what we did, so that uh, we have the context set in of how we have been moving along for, for the past 9 lectures and how we have arrived at this 10th lecture. So, the first lectures, the first couple of lectures were on uh, looking at the need for language, what is language itself and uh, the need for language. So, where there we discussed uh, what different kinds of uh, languages are there. We looked at the primary language system which is the animal communication system. We looked at why do I mean animals communicate, the reason for it and uh, we uh, looked at how, what are the characteristics of a language like that. Now, as I discussed there, there is a difference between communication and language because language has certain fact, language is more developed. It can express more number of ideas with limited number of uh, symbols, but communications cannot do that. Communication can only uh, express or transfer um, uh, exchange minimum number of ideas. So, that is one of the things. So, we looked at the primary uh, characteristics of animal communication system and from there on we looked at the human language system. So, we looked into detail the human language system, we looked at how the structure of the human language system is right from the idea of phonemes which is the basic speech sound to how they compose to get the morphemes and, and, and further on uh, the word, the sentence, the discourse and so on and so forth. So, we focused on to that and towards the end of this lecture we were looking at the evolution of language, uh, how language evolved. So, where does it come from and there we looked at how our uh, uh, great, great, great grandfather others, uh, the <coughs> Nindethal mans and uh, the homo sapiens, how they develop the language system, how does they uh, develop what language is all about and, and, and we looked at several evidences uh, which uh, provide us uh, the uh, fact of how language developed or how language came from uh, the proto language, the initial language that uh, our great grandfathers had. And one of the evidences that we discuss is something called Pidgin. So, we looked at how the language evolved over the years. So, that was the first section where we were just uh, dwelling around or moving around what language is all about. And then we moved on in the next two lectures into doing research in 
language. So, how do we do research in language? So, we took some model systems or model questions and based on those questions we evaluated <coughs> the research process in language. We looked at how uh, research design is made, how a problem is formulated, what is a problem, what is a theory, how does the research cycle move in, how induction, induction and deduction processes in the research cycle lead to uh, the theory giving, uh, uh, giving uh, rise to the hypothesis, then the observations and how the observation confirms certain results and then go, uh, and falsifying certain other results and then going back to the theory. So, using both the inductive and deductive logic, how do we go about this research plan? We also looked at what are uh, experimental designs, what are variables and how do they play a role in doing research into language. That is what we were doing and we should, uh, took up some model systems and based on this model systems uh, we did all of what I was talking about. Toward the end of the lecture, uh, we looked at uh, certain uh, brain areas particularly the Broca area and the Wernicke area and we looked at how these two areas are important for language uh, and what role do they play in language. Other than that, we also looked at some neuroimaging techniques or details about neuroimaging techniques and how these neuroimaging techniques actually reflect or help us in studying language. So, that is what we did in the first two lectures. So, they were very primary lec lectures on the research and language. Now, uh, for any language to uh, proceed or uh, uh, for any language to evolve, we have to have uh, the way of listening it. So, we have to have a receiver and we also have to have a, uh, an, a producer. So, some, some, some uh, a mechanism of uh, how language is uh, processed, perceived and um, um, a mechanism of how it is uh, produced in the first place. So, we looked at these two things. So, we started off the <coughs> Section number 3 uh, uh, by looking at how language is perceived, how do we hear and so we discussed the idea of how a sound wave is and what are fundamental frequencies, what are overtones and things like that. And other than that, we went into details about the auditory system. So, what is the auditory system like and how uh, the cochlea and uh, basilar membrane, how they are arranged and how they are connected to the uh, primary uh, somatosensory, uh, the primary auditory cortex and the secondary auditory cortex and how do they actually help us in hearing. Further to that, we also looked at the speech stream. So, when we speak what actually happens and that we can understand uh, with the help of something called a spectrograph. So, we looked at what the spectrograph uh, depicts uh, when it perceives speech and so, we looked at what are phonations uh, and, and things like how consonants and uh, what are consonants and vowels and how are they represented into the speech stream. We also looked at what is prosody and um, uh, how uh, these uh, uh, variations in vowels and consonants and uh, things like formants, uh, what are uh, sorens, what are fricatives, what are plosives, how, so these are variations of speech sound. So, uh, certain variations in when a uh, vowel or a consonant is produced and what are they, this is what we looked in detail. We also looked at that, uh, the so the question there was, do we perceive, because since we pro uh, produce sound in more or less. Uh, a continuous way. So, whether sound perception is continuous, so basically how is sound and so what we found out is that the production of sound uh, is continuous in nature. So, if it is continuous in nature, how do we perceive it, how do we listen to it and so we looked at uh, the idea of categorical processing and how uh, boundaries of words and phonemes are actually developed and so there we discussed about the phoneme restoration effect, how the uh, uh, certain phonemes if they are missing in sentences how they are restored by the brain. The, towards the end of it, we looked at the development of speech perception. So, how small children develop these ideas or develop these uh, uh, whole uh, uh, way of perceiving language or listening to language. So, in detail we those the, uh, we looked at the all those mechanisms which the child uses to uh, mark word boundaries, to mark uh, uh, phonological boundaries, to, to know since speech is continuous, how does he know where to which word is and that kind of a thing. And towards the end of the uh, this section we are looking at theories of speech perception. So, we looked at three basic theories. Uh, we looked at the uh, idea of uh, uh, Lieberman's theory, motor theory. So, that, that basically says that uh, speech perception is basically related to uh, the motor movements of uh, the area which is producing speech. 
uh, we also looked at uh, by, and, and what motor theory says is that by looking at the, uh, the motor area or those motor movements, the gestures which is producing speech, we can actually uh, generate the idea of what is being said. We also looked at the uh, general auditory framework which says the speech is not special and so it is like any other percep uh, uh, perception of uh, sound signal by the brain and then we looked at the idea of uh, uh, direct realism which says that the sound, the speech sound which comes to us uh, has all the information in it necessary and so we do not need to perceive speech as such. The uh, lastly we uh, took an, an uh, uh, overview of how speech is produced. So, we focused on uh, the vocal tract and how the vocal tract produces the, uh, the various consonants and vowels in the English language. So, a detail into uh, that. And uh, then we uh, looked at a little bit into uh, what is the Broca area and uh, what is the Wernicke area and how they are connected and the vertical and the, the uh, dorsal streams uh, which connect these areas and how uh, the, they, they function in detail. We also looked at the models of speech perception, so various models uh, that we discussed there. And uh, lastly, there we, uh, we looked at development of speech uh, production, so how the uh, speech production is developed in uh, children. So, that is what we were uh, doing up till now and in the immediate uh, lecture before this one which is lecture number 9 we were looking at words. Now, as I said word is important because it is a subway station or it is a uh, it is the main connection uh, between the sentence and uh, the morpheme. So, from word uh, from uh, speech production to speech understanding the word is the critical point which is there. So, we started uh, looking at what are words in terms of um, uh, like what does word symbolize. So, what is the uh, meaning of word as such or what is uh, symbolism of word and so there we looked at as word is uh, basically a um, it is a meaningful speech uh, sound or meaningful uh, unit of speech which can stand alone. So, we looked at how words represents a certain kind of a concepts and how they are represented. So, word is represented, words not only represent a certain concept or a mental representation of it, words are uh, saved in uh, both phonological and semantic form. So, words uh, basically how words are stored that is another thing that we looked at. Then we looked at certain kinds of words which uh, exist in the English language and we looked at the content word which is the noun word, verb and adjective and these are called the open class verb and we also looked at the function words. So, content words are the basic word forms which are there and the function words are uh, additional word word forms which uh, help us in, in connecting a uh, certain group of words together and so function words are prepositions, determiners and conjunctions that is what we looked at. We also looked at that words have something called the basic form and something called the uh, the extended form and so basic forms of word are called the lemma and the lexema all of the forms of the word. So, these are called shape shifters. Uh, we also looked at the phonology of word forms. So, basically how word uh, is composed in terms of its syllables and uh, we looked at how each word has something called an onset and a rhyma and so onset is the, the initial uh, consonant proportional of any word and then uh, the rhyma is the vowel, uh, the rhyma basically consists of the nucleus and the coda and the onset uh, the, is the consonant, the uh, rhyma is uh, the nucleus which is uh, which starts with uh, 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 co uh, uh, a vowel and followed by a con uh, consonant proportion. So, that is how we looked at how syllables are defined. We looked at uh, phonotactic rules which are uh, rules for combining phonemes together and lastly that we did in last class we, we were looking at symbol grounding problem of how words express symbols or how do words get the symbols or how they are related to the symbols. And we looked at three theories. Uh, the correlative theory says that by just being together word uh, uh, certain words uh, bringing together or certain uh, words co-occurring together they get this symbolism. Uh, which was not right because we challenged this uh, because Sarel challenged this in uh, through the Chinese room problem where he, where he uh, found out that just by uh, number of uh, uh, alphabets being together, number of words being together, they do not generate meaning. Uh, the second uh, answer that was given to uh, the symbol grounding problem is how do words uh, get the symbol or get related to the symbols that it is expressing or uh, the, the semantic in, in, uh, meaning that the words have, how do they get linked to it. Uh, the 
idea was uh, that it happens in terms of semantic primes which basically proposes that uh, there are certain basic primes or there are certain basic concepts which are already available and based on these concepts other concepts are developed and the word uh, gets the or uh, word gets linked to the uh, symbols. Also there is something called embo embodied representation which explains that symbols under are understood in terms of perceptual and uh, motor experiences. So basically it is not the, the, the perceptual experience the motor experiences are also there in understanding symbol and uh, that is where we left off. Now today what we <coughs> are going to do is we are going to start off where we left we are discussing the symbol grounding problem and so another interesting thing with word is something called sound symbolism. Now as you look at a word any word which is there the what the word says and what the word means are two different things. So basically uh, there is something called arbitrariness of a sing, uh, of uh, the word sound and the meaning that it is relating to. So, sound of a word the way it is spoken actually gives no information whatsoever about the meaning that is there and that is what is called the arbitrariness of the sign which is uh, given by Hockett in 1916. What he says is that observation that sounds of words give virtually no information about what it is meaning considering universal properties of language. Uh, uh, what what would happen is there has to be uh, uh, if if language is universal then uh, it it should uh, the word sound should relate to some of its uh, meaning now uh, nevertheless word forms in languages are more systematic than would be expected uh, if they were uh, truly arbitrary so even if uh, it is believed that way the words are the way the words are pronounced it gives no uh, no relation to what it is meaning still it is believed by looking at languages around the world it is believed that they are some form of systematically arranged words are systematically arranged or there is some systematic arrangement of words some systematic arrangement of word and symbol relation is there across languages so it, it is believed that still systematic sound symbols patterns are frequently used for example if you look at the english onset gl generally it should uh, it it relates to most words uh, with light and that is why you have words like glow, gleam, glitter, glisten and glossy glare. Okay. So basically what it says is that uh, uh, the way a word is spoken it although it has no relation it is totally arbitrary it is no relation to the meaning still looking at uh, uh, languages around the world we do see some kind of um, uh, uh, some kind of uh, systematic arrangement in 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 uh, relation to how a word is spoken and what is the meaning of it and the example that we have given here is if if a word starts with uh, gl there are very high chances that the number of words which is formed with gl uh, there are chances that they will mean something related to light and as you see the word which are formed with gl so it, it doesn't mean that all words which starts with gl will mean light but it says that a number of words which start with gl will actually mean light now the arrangement gl and the relation that it has to uh, light that is what we are talking about right. So how it is spoken and how it is related to the concept of life is that we are looking at. So uh, technically speaking the uh, GL is arbitrary symbol and it has nothing to do with light as you go around different languages in the world uh, most words uh, which represent light will not start with GL. If you look at how uh, light is expressed in, uh, in German or how it is expressed in Hindi or any other language, it, it might be possible that GL will not be uh, the starting word which expresses light. But then if you even if you look at words all around the world and uh, uh, even in the English language what it says is that if GL expresses light then most words or some words at least with GL will tend to be light as you see glow, gleam, glitter, glisten, glossy, glare all are related to uh, light. Now, so uh, basically then this, there is some kind of systematic arrangement uh, of how uh, uh, the words are pronounced and what it should mean. And then there we have the case of uh, onomatopoeia which is uh, basically these are words which expresses certain sounds. So, for example, bang. Now, this is a word which expresses a sound. So, word that represents a sound, for example, third bang, animal noises, uh, oing, ping, these are, or a cat says meow, all these words are basically uh, the, on, uh, the onomatopoeia. So, uh, what are these now? 
So, sound words they vary widely from languages to language. For example, the, uh, the pig says oink in English, but boo boo in Japanese. And so, this is another interesting thing to be looked at. Uh, more than 90 percent, 95 percent of adults agree uh, which is boo boo and which is kiki. Uh, if you do a search, you will come to know. So, basically, uh, boo boo the way it is spoken, the kiki the way it is spoken, and the way these are demonstrated people 90 per, 95 percent of adults will agree which of these is bobo and which of these is kiki and uh, these are sounds for the, the pig uh, what the pig speaks in Japanese. Now, how words are learned basically. So, uh, what we have done till now is we looked at what are words and how they attain the concept which is there and how do they solve the symbol how words attain not only the concepts how they are grounded into this concept. So, uh, we looked at how they attain this concept. So, and, and what are different kind of words in English language that is what we have been focusing on. Now, let us look at how words are learned. Now, generally speaking it is believed that uh, uh, the learning of a vocabulary or uh, words they start with a S shaped curve. Now, it is believed that vo vocabulary acquisition follows a S shaped curve. Now, from 0 to 18 months when a child is born the word learning is very slow. But from 18 to 6 years there is a vocabulary spurt. So, there is an increase, there is a dramatic increase in vocabulary and during this day or during this period 6 words are generally learned by the child each day with almost 14,000 words at the end of 6 years. So, from a 0 to 18 years the children learn very uh, words very slowly, but from 18 uh, 0 to 18 months and from 18 months onward to 6 years uh, they there is a vocabulary spurt and from 6 years ahead this is a fall. So, word learning drops and as you see this is how the curve will look like the S shaped curve. So, initially there is a uh, if this is how the child is born this is 18 months and from 18 months to 6 years. So, this is 6 years and from there on there is a drop. This is the until 18 months the word learning is slow vocabulary spurt during the preschool year. So, this is what it is and word learning tapers off somewhere in the uh, later childhood. So, uh, why does this happen? First of all reason for this vocabulary spurt one thing is that naming insight. The children acquire a naming insight. So, they start naming things and they, uh, they get this insight that this has a anything that they see has a particular name and that is the reason why uh, that that a particular spurt is there. So, why this spurt is there or why this increase sudden increase is there because at this age children starts naming things first of all. Then they attain the mastery of phonology from 0 to 18 months children are still learning or still understanding what are the word boundaries if, some, if something is spoken to uh, them. Uh, where should they break the words and or where should they break the speech stream into its constituent words. So, they are still learning the syntax and still learning how to uh, understand the speech stream, but after within 18 to uh, months to 6 years uh, uh, age the children has mastered phonology they have understood uh, the idea of word boundaries and phase boundaries and they start learning with this increased uh, uh, phonology or master phonology they start understanding uh, different words or start understanding the pronunciation of different words. Also, they are memory increases at this period of time. So, the child becomes uh, or the memory uh, power of the child increases the brain develops and due to this development the child can now store more number of words and can process more number of words and then increase social engagement. Also, there is this, this time the child becomes engaged socially, he starts meeting new people, he starts meeting friends and family and they come up with new words and the child, uh, child like a Home, he starts soaking up new words or understanding new words. So, so uh, basically then uh, uh, how uh, this learning of word uh, uh, is, is basically uh, tested. So, before that uh, learning of a word involves constructing a concept. So, how basically what are the steps of uh, learning a word? A word learning or learning about a word starts by first constructing a concept. The child has to first construct uh, <coughs> create a concept of a word. For example, if the word is cup, the child has to create the concept of this word and the concept creation requires us to understand this characteristic. So, what is word? It is something for uh, cup is something for storing a liquid. It has a handle, it is used for drinking, 
and so on and so forth. So, these are the, the characteristics of uh, this cup and the child then has to make this idea or this, uh, this kind of a concept that cup is this if uh, if an object has these properties then it is a cup. So, first, first thing is uh, learning this construct uh, or this concept of what a cup is and then they learn to uh, 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 learning the phonological word form and then they learn the phonological word form for example, how the cup is pronounced that is another thing and then there is something called associating concept with word form. So, the, it is a three step process in the first step uh, the child creates a concept based and this concept has these characteristics then it learns how cup is pronounced the phonology of it and then uh, the third is uh, they associate this phonology with this concept. So, this cup is associated this is the steps in which uh, the learning of a word takes place. So, uh, basically word learning starts with constructing a concept then a phonological word form and then links between uh, concept meaning and phonological form. So, how do we test this how do we test that uh, what uh, what words are learned there are two ways to doing it one is called the receptive vocal vocabulary and the other is called the productive vocabulary. So, what is receptive vocabulary? So, uh, looking at children who are learning words and uh, as I said word learning starts with first forming a concept the child has to uh, know that whatever name has been given to it or whatever name he is uh, repeating whatever word he is repeating, uh, repeating that has a uh, that has certain properties and this is a concept for example, cup is a concept and so he has to learn that and this concept will have certain properties and so this is how it does. Not only that he also has to learn the phonological properties of how cup is pronounced and then later relate to that, but how do I test that this word is learned or how much word is learned by a child that is done by something called receptive vocabulary when does the receptive vocabulary of children and what is receptive vocabulary? It is a set of uh, word persons recognize and understands the meaning of. So, receptive vocabulary is the number of words it is a set of words uh, or number of words person recognizes and understands the meaning of and it is also word learning is also tested in terms of productive vocabulary which are set of words person produces in appropriate context. So, uh, receptive vocabulary is how many words can you understand the meaning of right. So, uh, and you can recognize that and productive like uh, vocabulary. So, it's, it, it may so happen that you may not understand the meaning of a word, but you can actually use a word in a particular sentence or a particular context and that is called productive vocabulary. So, set of words person produces in appropriate context that is there. So, you may know a word but you may not be able to use it or it may be possible that you using a word in a particular context, but you may not be able to uh, uh, understand the meaning of that could also happen this happens with us in uh, in reading also sometimes we, we read we look and based on the context we develop uh, the, the meaning of or we extract the meaning of certain words. So, this is basically the receptive and uh, productive vocabulary. So, uh, then how does this process of learning the word actually takes place the for concept formation that we talk about. So, this concept formation the understanding the phonological form and relating the concept formation with the phonological form how does this take place or what is the process. So, uh, there are two ways to looking at it uh, the one is called the fast mapping and the other is called the slow mapping. So, in fast map mapping what happens it is the ability to learn new words only after a few exposures. So, children learn words basically linking the, uh, the concept and phonology together by using uh, either the fast mapping or the slow mapping system. In the fast mapping what happens it is the ability to learn new words only after a few exposures uh, which are there. So, word recognition as I said word recognition starts with speech perception and assessing of the phonological representation before the semantic representation. So, first understanding the phonological representation and then understanding the semantic uh, representation. So, how is word recognized? Now, word production begins with a semantic representation and accessing a phonological representation for the speech production. Word repetition accesses a phonological representation, but not necessarily the semantic representation since we can repeat words we do not have meaning for and so that is how it is this is word repetition, this is word production and this is word recognition. If you look at word recognition it starts with something called speech perception then speech perception leads to phonological representation and the receptive link is established between spe uh, semantic representation. If you look at word production how word is produced it starts with semantic representation first you have to think about the concept. So, if you want to produce a word you have to think about that word or what it represents and then through an expressive link generate the 
possible phones which should express this word and from there you produce speech. But in word rep uh, representation a speech perception and speech production are the only reasons which are there and it happens only at the level of the phonological representation. It does not go to the level of semantic representations. Now, uh, in learning word an another uh, a major problem that happens in learning word is something called referential uncertainty. And so, what is referential uncertainty? The referential uncertainty problem says that there is no direct link between the word and the object that it refers to. So, basically referential uh, uncertainty is an observation that there is no direct link uh, between the word and the object event it refers to. Now, how to solve this referential, referential uh, uncertainty? See, words refer to certain concepts and what happens is if you look at the word in different languages it may so happen that it may not represent the same concept. For example, look at dog. Now, the concept is it is a pet animal, it barks, uh, four legs has a tail, but Inu is also representing the same concept and uh, uh, Gao is also representing the same concept and Hund the word is representing the same concept. Now, <coughs> this is basically called referential uncertainty. There is no direct link between the word and the object it is uh, representing to all these words are representing to the same thing. So, there is no direct link between them. So, how do I uh, or multiple words representing the same I, uh, concept. So, how do I solve this uh, referential uncertainty in word perception uh, or word recognition? The first idea is something using called whole object representation. So, what is uh, the uh, whole object uh, representation. So, basically solving referential uh, uh, uncertainty is through providing certain kind of cognitive constraints to children. So, cognitive constraints that guide ch uh, children in narrowing down the possible range of reference for a new word. Now, uh, let us look at this. Let us assume that a child learns a new word. For example, he learns the word dog. Now, there is no link because the uh, the parent says dog dog and he the parent shows the child a dog and he says dog but it may be possible that there are other uh, certain other uh, things maybe a cat is sitting right uh, next to the dog so how does the child know what is the dog and even if he looks at the dog uh, maybe uh, he sees the dog has a head and 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 he has a tail which is uh, whirling around it has four legs so whether this tail is the dog or whether this body is the dog or the whole object is the dog or what is the dog? How does it know that dog means everything? So, how do you solve this kind of a referential un uncertainty and that happens by providing certain kind of cognitive constraints. So, that and why these cognitive constraints are provided or how these cognitive constraints actually help the child in, uh, in solving the referential uncertainty what the parent is referring to uh, that is done by, uh, the, by using cognitive constraints which narrow down the possible range of reference for a new word. So, if the child is running a new, uh, new word these cognitive constraints uh, help him in understanding that okay, this is the uh, idea or this is the object that the parent is referring to or anybody is referring to. So, certain kind of uh, cognitive constraints are used one is called the object whole object assumption. Now, the new word refers to entire object and not just part of it. One assumption that small children use while learning new word is that whenever a, pa a parent is showing a particular or it, uh, uh, telling him uh, or making him learn a new word he is actually referring to the whole thing the whole object that uh, the parent is pointing at. For example, if the parent is making the child learn dog, uh, he assumes that the whole dog is what is being referred to. Dog does not refer to just the tail or the legs and so on and so forth and so the child follows this whole object assumption. So, uh, assume doggy means the whole animal and not just the tail of it. So, this is one way of solving the referential uncertainty problem. What are the other ways of sol solving this referential uncertainty problem? The other way is using taxonomic assumptions. So, what is taxonomic assumptions? Uh, new word extends to other similar uh, reference. So, uh, basically what it means that uh, assuming doggy means similar animals in general not just this specific animal which basically means that child now uh, understands that doggy or dog what the parent is referring to is first of all it is the object the whole object the whole four legged animal which is there and also other animals 
which are similar to this particular uh, dog or will also be called doggy. So, that is called taxonomic assumption. He extends this idea to other members of the group and then something called mutual uh, uh, exclusively mutual ex exclusivity assumption is also used by the uh, child and so it means that no two words mean exactly the same thing. It would mean that uh, two words do not ex exactly uh, mean the same thing. So, if the parent says dog and he says tail, it does not mean that it should not mean that or he believes that dog and tail are two different things, it is not the same thing. If he does not use these assumptions, he will never learn the idea of how words are related or how words are related to certain concepts. And so, no two words, are, so mutual uh, exclusively assumption says that no two words mean exactly the same thing, assuming that tail does not mean doggy, but rather something about the dog. So, this is another thing that the <coughs> child uses in uh, uh, solving the referential uncertainty problem. So, uh, this is about fast mapping as I said uh, if word learning is fast or word learning can be done in a fast way uh, by learning uh, words in one or two demonstration only. There is another way to learning word and that is called the slow mapping. In this what happens is learning words gradually over multiple exposures. So, basically then uh, resolving this uh, uh, this uh, referential ambiguity that we are talking about or uh, this referential uncertainty is basically uh, same as it is it's, it's not the same as establishing a permanent link in memory between word form and concept. Basically, if word learning uh, uh, produces word in appropriate context, this is fast learning and, and it, it leads to something called uh, associative learning. Now, there is another way of learning words and that is called the uh, slow mapping of words and so learning words over mutual exposures and for that we have something called a cross situational word learning. In this way also children, children learn word and how do they learn words through the slow mapping uh, by using something called cross situational word learning. What happens here is associative novel words with novel objects by tracking co occurrence statistics. So, what happens here is that cross, learn, cross situational word learning uh, is the ability to learn uh, associative novel words with novel objects even in case of referential ambiguity by tracking co-occurring uh, statistics. Now, it so may happen that uh, the child uh, develops this re referential uncertainty, but what he does is if the same dog appears in many number of contexts. So, it appears with a cat and then in some other instance or some other time the dog appears with a table and in third uh, 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 instance the dog appears with uh, uh, food and so on and so forth. So, the child develops this referential statistics or uh, this referential uh, 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 develops this co occurrence statistics and based on that he develops this idea that ok since this object is coming every time and the second object that it is coming with is varying. So, this is particularly what the parent is referring to or this is particularly what the concept is and this is what a dog is all about. So, uh, basically how he does that? He does that using something called a propose but verify strategy. When encountering a new word in an ambiguous context, uh, both childs and adults, uh, they make a guess about what the uh, word actually refers to. The repeated co-occurrence of a word and referent in different contexts solidifies the connection between the word form and concept in long term memory. So, as I explained in multiple occurrences, if he sees the same word or co-occurring with other words which are there, he slowly develops this idea that this is what probably the concept is referring to or this word is referring to this particular concept or what is the meaning of this word. So, this is what a dog is all about. There is also something called joint attention that also leads to a process of slow learning. So, what is joint attention? Situations in which all participants focus attention on the same object or even and it re reduces referential ambiguity. So, a situation in which all participants in an interaction have focused uh, their attention on the same object or event. In those cases, so uh, everybody who is talking about that uh, or in the, that conversation has focus their attention on that particular word and that leads to a situation of joint attention and this leads to referential ambiguity. So, everybody <coughs> points at the same thing and says dog or referring to the same thing and it is says dog, it is basically uh, the idea of joint attention. And then there is something called uh, syntactic bootstrapping is also used. It is the use of syntactic information to infer meaning of verbs. For example, John is gro uh, groping versus John is groping to the cat and so this basically in, in this case uh, the verb is uh, used through 
or verb is identified through something called syntactic bootstrapping. So, using the syntactic information the idea of what a verb really means. So, uh, basically uh, the idea or the meaning of this grouping is understood through this. So, basically if somebody says John is groping one picture and the other picture is John is groping the cat. So, groping what does it really mean? That is expressed or that is uh, understood uh, by the child by using this uh, syntactic bootstrapping which basically means that grouping is a verb and so this is the act of grouping. So, he looks at multiple sentences with grouping and based on that he develops the meaning of grouping uh, from those sentences. For example, by hearing the word ball in several situations where a ball and other objects are present, the infant can gradually infer the meaning of ball. So, this is ball, this is bat in one situation, this is dog, this is ball in another situation, the infant knows that this is what the ball is and this is called a cross modal statistics. So, and then again nouns are more easier to learn their verb because their reference are concrete uh, objects and the child can look at the uh, and interact with them. So, learning was <laughs> difficult than nouns is because nouns actually have concrete referentials in, in uh, comparison to verb. Gleitman 1990 found that young children make use of syntactic information to infer the meaning of verb and that is how what we showed uh, to you. So, basically uh, they use something called syntactic uh, uh, bootstrapping for understanding the meaning of word and how does this happen? They look at the different contextual cues in different ways in, in different pictures. Uh, so, John is groping, John is groping the cat, uh, something is John is groping the table some, or John is groping something else and so that is how he understands what groping the act of groping actually means because in several pictures if the same person does the same act with different objects we understand that okay what is happening is this is or different people also do that act he understands that this is the meaning of act and that is called syntactic brute strapping. Now, infants use their partial knowledge of syntax to make inferences about the meaning of newly encountered words. Given the frame the x is y, the child knows x is probably a noun phrase and y is a verb phrase. Now, if you look at this, this is a verb is, is being, b is a verb and so the child understands that x is y is basically x is the noun phrase and is y is the verb phrase and based on that he understands the meaning. So, a model of speech perception is that he uses phonetic and prosodic analysis and based on that prosodic boundaries he understands that this is the noun phrase and this is the verb phrase and so he then uh, extracts the functional word from the uses the mental lexicon to look at the content words lexical excess is there and semantic representations free lexical information and speech signal. So, basically uses this kind of a model to extract the meaning of uh, the, the partial knowledge of syntax helps them in understanding the meaning of newly encountered words. So, uh, basically then another interesting thing in learning words in children is in terms uh, is in terms of what neighborhood words are there and how neighborhood words actually influence word learning. Now, characteristics of word form affect how easily they are learned. Uh, for example, uh, one interesting thing is word frequency. So, the word form that you are using they can influence or they can this word form will tell or they can basically predict how easily words are learned. Now, one in interesting fact is something called word frequency, how often a particular word uh, occurs in all forms of the language. So, word, fre word frequency is how often a word in all forms occurs in a language. If you see uh, more number of uh, the same word in, in more number of forms it is, it is appearing in a language, it is more easily learned. Also, function words for example, the and of are remembered uh, more frequently than context word which are uh, content word which are uh, uh, which are learned in less common. Now, children learn uh, uh, rare words more often than they learn uh, and also children learn the nouns uh, first followed by the verbs. So, most children learn the noun first then they learn the verb then they learn the adjective and do not use function words uh, regularly. So, basically if you, if you look at children what they do is this function words and uh, verbs are something that they learn late, they use they learn the noun because nouns can be used in all <coughs> different forms in a language. Look at uh, any noun for example, dog, so dogs, the 
doggy and so on and so forth. So, basically in different forms in a uh, singular, in a plural, first person, second person and so in, in different ways the nouns can be used and so they are learned faster than verbs and adjectives and function words, uh, the connecting words are learned the la least or the uh, last by children. So, uh, another interesting thing is neighborhood density. So, what is neighborhood density? How many other words uh, differ from a particular word by substituting a single phoneme? That is called neighborhood density uh, of a particular word. For example, look at this. If we have hat, now the neighborhood density of this is if we, if we uh, re uh, replace the H phoneme and keep the AT phoneme, these number of words can actually uh, be formed. We can have pat, chat, cat, bat, fat, sat, vat and if we replace the A phoneme and keep the H and T, we can have heat, hit, hate, hot, hoot, height and if we uh, remove the T phoneme and uh, uh, let the H and A phoneme be here, we can have words like hatch, hack, had, hag. So, it has high number of a high density there. But if you look at words like juice, it is very difficult to find a thing like that. For example, remove the J for name, you will have goose, lose, use, moose, news. But if with replacing the UI for name and J C E, we will have no word at all. And in fact, if we replace the C E for name, we can have Jewel and June. So, it has a, uh, a very narrow neighborhood density and this has a high neighborhood density. So, neighborhood density is another interesting uh, thing uh, which is uh, helping the child learn words. Also, we use something called uh, the uh, phonetic probability which is the likelihood that a particular sequence of phonemes will occur um, in a particular language that is also used by uh, children in learning word. For example, stress patterns can also influence uh, word learning in youngsters. We have, if we have a two syllable noun, a triachic uh, form which is a strong weak form, the stress pattern uh, will will be uh, e it will be easier to uh, be learned by the children. For example, words like basket and pillow. But if we have a uh, iambic uh, uh, an iambic syllable form uh, of two nouns, for example, we have weak and strong pattern, for example, guitar and amount, this will take more time for the child to learn. Now, infants then use something called the metrical segment that we have discussed before uh, strategy to infer word boundaries uh, before stress syllable. And in 2013, they found that infants need support both from the stress patterns and the phonetic regularity uh, to learn words. So, basically it is the phonetic regularity, phonetic probability, the stress patterns, they also influence how a word is learned or how a word learning will actually happen. So, word learning, so how are words stored? Uh, the, the way words are stored into the memory, they are stored as in phonological form. So, how are words actually learned? The mental lexicon is the storage of a information about a word in long term memory. Now, any word is stored in two forms, it is stored in a uh, phonological information which is the pronunciation of the word and then it has a semantic information which is the meaning of the word. So, mental lexicon storage of information about word in long term memory and it is done in these two ways. So, word are st uh, stored as a set of phonemes, we are all only looking at the phonological form, we are not looking at the semantic form now. So, words st are stored as set of phonemes, evidences and so this idea that words are stored in the mental lexicon in the long term memory in terms of a set of phonemes is evident from speech errors. For example, if we say, um, we say keep your feet moving and we can have errors like we can have error like foot moving and this kind of error from feet moving to foot moving actually expresses the e e turns into o o and this basically says that the words are actually stored in terms of pronunciation also uh, in, in the mental lexicon. Also problems like speech errors like this take my bike becomes bake my bike is because the t is replaced by a b sound 
and that is the reason why the take becomes big. And this basically these speech errors give us an idea that words are not only stored as meaning in the mental, uh, in the mental lexicon in, in the uh, long term memory, words are also stored in terms of the phonological form or in terms of the pronunciation. Now, uh, very common words are actually stored as syllables, only basic form of a word is stored in memory, other forms are generated to the rule. For example, we have the, uh, the this, so basically what happens is that in, uh, in, the, in the long term memory, you only have the basic word form which is stored which is the lemma and this lemma then people use this lemma to produce, to reproduce or to generate more forms of the word. So, can generate plurals and past tenses from non words and the, ex and the reason or, or the clue that basic forms of the word are stored into the mental lexicon is that people can generate plural and past tenses for non words also. Basic, basically, if non words uh, are, if we can generate plural for non words, it basically means that the generation of plural is a process oriented thing, it is not a storage oriented thing. Had plurals been stored into long term memory, then non words plural would not have been stored because people do not learn non words. But the, the moment you understand this that people are able to generate plurals for non word, it basically means that people are only storing the lemma, the basic form of a word. For example, dax means daxes and blick means blicked. And if you are able to generate this kind of plural, this is a process, generating plural is a process oriented thing and it is not a storage oriented thing and this basically says that words are stored into the basic lemma form only. So, bleak is there and that is why we can generate the plural. So, we can generate plural for these kind of thing. Also, irregular words are stored separately. So, irregular word forms are separate entries uh, or by analogy. For example, foot, feet, but facetiously moves is mees. So, uh, that is what it is and so it means that irregular forms, uh, irregular word forms are actually stored into the memory. So, uh, in, in its in its uh, in its entire form, but in, in, in not as lemma, but it is entire form. So, for example, moves, mees will be stored and for foot, feet will be stored and that is the uh, irregular form. So, words stored separately. For example, men and man both will be stored. So, because the plural of man is man and so though both have to be stored into the uh, in, in these cases both have to be stored into the long term memory. For But for words like uh, uh, let us say dog or cat only the dogs uh, we can make plural with dogs and cats which basically means that only the word dog or cat is stored into the long term memory which is the lemma form. But this kind of men, uh, men or goose, geese, data, datum for these both forms have to be stored in long term memory. Now, the experimental evidence is there, uh, the experimental evidence is that uh, the basic form is there in the mental lexicon and suffixes, uh, if you put suffixes word recognition or word uh, production is there. So, inflection suffixes add for purpose of grammar, for example, toy, toys, play, plays, played, playing. So, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, inflection suffix, uh, which is suffix plus word for grammar in the inflectional form, for example, toy leads to toys and play leads to both play, plays, played, that, that gives us some idea that uh, word is stored in the, this kind of uh, basic words is stored in terms of the lemma form. Uh, there is something called derivational suffix, uh, which changes meaning and grammatical category. For example, look at agree, in a verb it means agreement and in noun it means agreeable and so this this is the derivational suffix. So, using the inflectional suffix uh, you can uh, produce various forms of the word and derivational suffix says that verb can also change uh, uh, its grammatical category and more frequent words are recalled uh, more quick, uh, quickly and that happens because of something called the base frequency effect. The frequency effect of, a, uh, of base of for extends to inflected forms. The frequency effect of the base forms extends to its inflected forms. Not, not all derived words uh, form exhibit the base frequency word. For example, look at the et suffix ity. If you add it to the adjective serene, it becomes serenity, which is a noun. So, also to uh, 
to derive forms if no change of pronunciation is there for agree means agreement and no base frequency effect with change in pronunciation for example, serene becomes serenity. So, base frequency effect is that. Now, so uh, that is how uh, the phonological representations of words are stored or how words are stored into the phonological representation. So, uh, we will uh, take a break today and we will uh, look at the mental lexicon or exploring the mental lexicon uh, uh, in, in terms of the semantic forms of word in the next class. So, before we do that, uh, let us look at what we did today. So, what we did in today's lecture is we uh, looked at um, uh, the the idea of how sign, sound symbolism or the arbitrariness of any word, uh, how that, that, that arbitrariness is solved and how the referential uh, ambiguity is solved in, uh, in, in terms of words understanding or, um, uh, or uh, uh, understanding words. We also looked at how words are learned, what is the process of learning uh, words uh, and what is receptive and uh, uh, productive vocabulary. We looked at two methods of le word learning which is the fast learning and how fast learning uh, takes care of uh, <coughs> this re referential ambiguity and we also looked at the slow learning of uh, words which, uh, which are there. So, we looked at several uh, uh, in, in fast learning we looked at the idea of uh, the whole uh, assumption, the taxonomic assumption and mutual ex exclusivity assumption of solving the referential ambiguity. We also looked at how neighboring words uh, or the density of neighboring words actually help us in learning words. We also looked at the, the various phonological forms of how words are stored. So, basically those evidences that words are stored in terms of its phonology. <coughs> or in terms of how they are pronounced. Now, when we meet next, we will look at the semantic forms of uh, the how words are stored and we will de deal in detail of how the, the semantic forms are related to uh, the phonological form and how actually words are stored. We also will look at how words are retrieved from long term memory, what is the process of retrieving the uh, word from long term memory when we meet in the next lecture. So, up till that time that we meet in the next lecture, it is goodbye and thank you.